Howard on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Ken Silverstein, former Hopper's Washington editor, an investigative former investigative reporter for the Los Angeles Times, and now a senior investigative reporter with First Look Media, author of the new released, uh, newly released The Secret World of Oil. Welcome to the program, Ken. Thank you. So, uh, Ken, let me... I mean, I think to a certain extent, we all have a, a vague notion that, uh, I mean, obviously uh, the idea of oil as uh, a, a problem in terms of our environment and a, a sort of a broad understanding of how oil is really one of the primary, if not the primary uh, resource that has fundamentally affected our foreign policy and caused us to engage in, at least um, in recent uh, times, uh, uh, a lot of, well, war, uh, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. your, your book sort of fills in almost sort of like the glue on how this works. Um, just I mean, give us a, 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 let's just start with this broad overview of why you focused on I guess uh, what you call the 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 fixers and the traders and the um, the, the the all the sort of the middlemen here. Well, first off, you're right about you know the role of oil in generating conflict. I mean, it is obviously the fuel, literally, um, that makes the global economy work, and so there's a lot of competition over it. And I wouldn't go so far as to say that the Iraq war was all about oil, but anybody who thinks that the planners of that war weren't looking at uh, maps of the region and, uh, and, and, and analyzing data about how much oil comes from that region and uh, that Iraq might have an, in its uh, territory has got to be dreaming. I mean, clearly it was a factor in the war and probably a pretty big one. Um, I looked at the fixers and the oil traders in particular, the middlemen, really, between the oil companies and third world governments where most of the oil <clears throat> is found. I mean, this is one of the reasons that oil um, is so corrupt and why it's had such a big impact on our foreign policy is because most of it historically has been found in the third world in countries that are pretty corrupt, sometimes because we've installed corrupt regimes there. Um, and, and most of it is pumped out uh, or a lot of it is pumped out by Western companies and shipped to the first world to run our planes and tanks and factories um, and cars, of course. So I focused on these middlemen because basically because nobody has, and I'm an investigative reporter, and so that was really interesting to me. Um, these are people who, as I said, broker the deals between the companies and the government. So if you're Exxon, for example, uh, purely for example, and you want to get a oil concession in Nigeria. It's not like the Nigerian government is going to put out a, a bid and then, you know, do a closed door review of the bids and award the contract to the best bidder, the bid that will do the best for the people of Nigeria. They're going to be looking for, you know, when they dole out that contract, they're going to be looking for who's going to do best for them, as in the, you know, the senior officials of the Nigerian government. And the people are of little concern. You pumped, Nigeria's pumped hundreds of billions of dollars worth of oil over the last 30 or 40 years. And I remember once talking to a CIA official who said he had traveled to Nigeria pretty extensively. And in interviewing people there, you know, the view that he heard was that Nigeria would have been off if the oil had just been left in the ground because it's all been, you know, pumped out, caused a lot of environmental environmental destruction and very you know a small group of people have gotten very rich off of it <clears throat> um so anyway you need um in nigeria or equatorial guinea or kazakhstan or azerbaijan in a lot of places um oil companies uh rely on these middlemen who you know the old model was that they just flat out bribed uh government officials so you know the oil companies would would pay them to be consultants. You know, I put consultants, or I'll put consultants in quotes. And they get these huge fees, and they take part of their fee and wire it into a Swiss account controlled by the president of whatever country he was negotiating with. Um, and he'd keep the rest. That was the way it worked. 
you know, just pretty standard corruption. And now it's become a lot more complicated, uh, partly because of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and European laws that banned bribery about, I think, about 10 years ago. Until about 10 years ago, you could deduct your um, bribes on your taxes in Europe. But now it's gotten more complicated. So you look for ways to pay off government officials, hopefully without flat out bribing them, um, but sometimes, no doubt, um, you know, you still have money that's just directly funneled into maybe an offshore account controlled by the oil minister's nephew or something like that. But sometimes, you know, the oil companies, um, you can peri periodically somebody goes to jail. There's a senior Halliburton official who's in jail for uh, being complicit in the scheme to bribe senior Nigerian officials to get, I think it was a $6 billion gas contract over there. Jack Stanley is the name of the executive and he went to jail. Um, but often they're looking for ways to not flat out bribe officials, um, but to basically do the same thing. So for example, Exxon wants an Equatorial Guinea, um, which is a small country on the west coast of Africa, you know, half a million people, and suddenly a lot of oil was discovered over there. You can't do business over there without basically paying off the government officials, the president, President Obiang. Mm -hmm seized power in 1979. He's not going anywhere. He and his family, it's basically a crime syndicate running that country. So if you want to do business over there, you are going to pay for the privilege. So Exxon did a bunch of things um, uh, to get the privilege. And for example, Obiang owns a whole lot of land in, in Equatorial Guinea, the president. He swiped it. I mean, he came to power in 1975 and just stole a lot of it. Um, but Exxon wanted land uh, for its compound and, and maybe for some of its development over there. Um, uh, so they bought it from President Obiang, and they probably paid way more than the land was worth. It's hard to evaluate land values over there, but right. it's almost certain that they paid far more than it's worth. It's just a new way to, to bribe governments. They also hired the, the, the minister of security who was listed in State Department reports as a torturer. He had a security company. They hired his company to guard, you know, to provide some sort of service guarding their compound or something or other. So, you know, it's it's the way it's always worked, um, but it's rarely seen the light of day. So I thought it would be an interesting topic to look at. I mean, you know, the uh, and, and I want to get into some of the, the, the specifics um, because you, you, you spent quite um, a, a bit of time in the book uh, with Obiang and uh, sort of just the, the the lifestyle uh, that he leads, and uh, there's also a couple other um, uh, uh, specific characters I'd like to, to talk about, just because it's 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 fascinating. Um, but 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 broadly speaking, uh, I mean, let, let's talk about the sort of the the there, there's sort of two ends uh, of of this dynamic. One is that you uh, that we these guys are. I mean, they're out for themselves on some level, but they, they are subjugating ultimately. I mean, you're talking millions of people uh, in terms of if you are unlucky enough to live above that oil, um, it, is, it, it just creates this dynamic. I mean, it, it, it obviously it stifles any type of democracy in that country, right? And, and it has, what kind of effect does it have on on our end of it? I mean, we're the ones pulling the oil out of the ground, more or less. Well, several people I talked to, uh, you know, including some of the middlemen and, and, and a former Chevron executive named Ed Chow said, you know, hey, if Americans want cheap gas, this is part of the price we're, we're going to pay for it. There's just, you can't have democracy in these countries without, um, uh, if you've got oil, you're not. If you want cheap oil, if you're going to get it from these countries and pay less for it, um, because we're bribing people, you you just you know that's that's the price to be paid. I should say he was not in any way justifying that. Um, he was simply stating it as a fact of life. As long as Americans want cheap oil, we can't have democracy in these countries. I mean, you you just you know, if you're an oil company and you want. In Equatorial Guinea, for example, you know, you've had a government in power for 35 years, just one of the world's most rotten regimes. I mean, the oil companies in some ways, 
I suppose, would probably prefer not to be dealing with corrupt governments. But on the other hand, it's quite convenient. They enjoy it. They like it because it's easy. You know, if you're going uh, in Texas, for example, you know, you um, there's a benefit. Um, I mean, you know, this is a subject of controversy, but the wealth generated by oil, obviously, everywhere it flows mostly to the top. But in Texas, you know, if you've got oil on your land and the companies are, are, are pumping it, you're getting a royalty. A lot of money have done, a lot of people have done well um, for themselves. It creates, you know, oil typically is not one of the greatest job producing industries, but it produces some jobs. Um, but in Equatorial Guinea, so in, I'm sorry, in, in Texas, you know, I, I mean, I've traveled to Texas. I've traveled to Louisiana, oil rich states, and oil's created a lot of damage, but there's no question many residents of those states are pro-oil. I mean, they do like the industry because a lot of people have benefited from it. And, you know, there's no, you know, whatever you think of oil, that's, there's just no denying that. I mean, we may think that it's destroying the planet, but that's just a fact of life. Um, in Equatorial Guinea, you don't have that. You can't build popular support in Equatorial Guinea because you've got a government that's stealing all of the oil wealth. Um, and it creates very few jobs uh, overseas. When just, you know, when you're just taking it out of the ground or from under the ocean, it creates very few jobs. And in a lot of these countries, many of those jobs don't go to locals. So there's no way that the population is going to support oil. So if you have to you know, convince, if you have to build popular support in Equatorial Guinea, forget it. But if there's a dictator in power, and all you have to do is make him and a few other people happy, and you've got some money to throw around, whether it's a direct bribe or you just overpay for his stolen land for your you know, oil development, um, it's great. I mean, it's real easy to line up the support you need because it's just a few people. Right. It's, so just, a, it's the, just a question of how much is it going to be? We know it's a number. We just got to figure out what that number is. Exactly. And you know also that that number you know, compared to the profits you're going to make is going to be tiny. Because Obiang, by some estimates, the president of Equatorial Guinea is one of the, I think he was rated by Forbes at one point as the sixth or eighth richest uh, head of state. Um, and that's pretty astonishing because it's a very small country. So, you know, he's stolen a ton of money. Most of it, though, is just the, you know, the oil is, uh, there's a state oil company that takes a big cut and Certainly, some of that, a lot of that money goes into the pockets of the ruling family. But, um, you know, whatever Chev uh, Exxon overpaid for the land or however much they paid the security company owned by the, the, uh, the Minister of Security to, to guard their compound or their property, it's a tiny amount of money. I mean, if you're, if you're throwing around uh, $10 million in bribes, say, and you're making billions and billions of dollars in profits, who cares? It's literally pocket change. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to spread around too much vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the profits you get. So it's, it's easy. You know, why bother? It's no fun having to line up public support when you can just pay off a few top people. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that dynamic, I mean, it, it occurs to me that there was a, there was a story uh, that in uh, coming out of Ottawa that the Canadian government may sue the United States for its delay on approving Keystone under a provision of NAFTA, which, um, you know, essentially uh, equalizes, um, which basically basically says, you know, you can't you can't stand in the way. Uh, we have a, we have a deal and you can't stand in the way of us uh, shipping this oil through your country based upon whatever environmental concerns. Uh, et cetera. And this is supposedly the model of the the TPP. And in some ways it is to conform. I mean, it just occurs to me as you were explaining that dynamic that uh, it, it has the similar process where it's we need to eliminate the uh, it is far more effective for industry to eliminate when we're talking about transnational um, exchange of, of resources and money. Uh, we need to eliminate that sort of messy part about the people on the ground who may have the uh, political will or desire to not have us do this thing. And it's easier, obviously, if there's a dictator. But in some ways, it's sort of like that's what um, 
uh, corporations don't want to have to deal with the, uh, I guess, the uh, uncertainty of democracy. Yeah, definitely not. It's you know, and here we just, in some ways, I, I actually had um, a trader, uh, an oil trader in Geneva, uh, say to me, "Hey, you know, you call that corruption? What you know, in in the third world when bribes are paid." But it's basically the same way we do it. We just have lobbyists and political action committees, and you make contributions to politicians. It's just a different form of bribery, but it's basically the same thing. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense, you know, over in Equatorial Guinea, you don't pay for lobbyists. You spend that money on uh, making government officials happy. And here, you, you just, you know, you spend a whole lot of money. You may even spend more. It's probably It's probably well more expensive to... Uh, hire lobbyists and make all these political contributions than it is to bribe people. But you're, you know, basically trying to do the same thing. You're lining up political support. In this country and in Canada and in other places, you line up political support in one way. And in Equatorial Guinea and Kazakhstan, you just go straight to the top and, and line up, you know, five or ten top people and all is well. Is is oil a uh, a unique is oil a unique commodity in terms of of this dynamic? I mean, uh, you know, maybe that's that's outside of your your purview. But I mean, is there is there something specific about oil just because it is so necessary in every society, and it, it sort of um, it, it cheap oil basically brings a certain amount of economic stability? Um, is is it unique beyond that too in terms of these dynamics? Well, it, it's certain. It certainly is unique, and you know, you. It's not. Co- it's not a coincidence that oil is generally deemed to be the most corrupt industry. The only thing that compares with it, if you look at Foreign Corrupt Practice Act prosecutions, or if you just generally look at big, big international corruption cases, oil pops up more than anything, even more than weapons, arms trafficking, which is the second. Most, I would guess is probably the second most corrupt industry. Um, and the reason for that is one of the things that I noted above is or noted earlier um, is that uh, a lot of it is found in countries known for corruption in Africa, Central Asia, and elsewhere, and shipped to richer countries. So you you have um, you know you're dealing with when you're dealing with an Obiang in Equatorial Guinea, cash is going to change hands. Um, so it's just you know it's geography. But another reason is that oil is so incredibly sensitive um, that a very small group of people deal with it, um, especially in the countries that that produce it. Um, Oil is, you know, the two, I I had someone once say to me that the two, he described them as sovereign goods, the only two sovereign goods, two goods most important to the state are um, oil and weaponry. You need weapons to protect your borders, or in some cases, unfortunately, to repress your people so that they don't overthrow you. And you need oil to run your military and your economy. And so um, there's, in, in, in a lot of places, there's just a handful of people who are, who are dealing with these decisions that uh, involve billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know, that's another thing about oil. If you're selling socks, you know, you need to get a whole bunch of little contracts to make money. If you're selling oil, you you just need one or two. The stakes are incredibly high. I mean, if you're selling socks and you lose a uh, million sock deal, <laughs> it's not the end of the world. I mean, you're, you're, you try to close every deal. But if you're trying to get a concession in Kazakhstan that you, know, you may make money on for 20 years, um, the stakes are really, really high. And for all of those reasons, um, uh, oil just tends to be, uh, or it doesn't tend to be. For those reasons, it is more corrupt than most any other industry, probably any other industry. You know, it's interesting. I, I hadn't realized that. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it makes sense to to hear it. But um, one of the things that occurred to me. Um, uh, relative to your book is the um, uh, a story that um, uh, a, a guy named Guy Lawson is writing about those uh, those two stoner uh, uh, arms dealers who uh, yeah. 
who got uh, caught down in, in Florida. And the the one of the dynamics there is that, you know, the it was not so uh, that that on some level, these guys, the, the, the U.S. government just sort of turned an eye, just just didn't look in the right direction. You know, it's one of those things like, you know, the cop on the beat is just like, well, you know, I'm only going to look to my left. So whatever you do on your right, uh, that's OK. And it's, you know. There's this relationship, it seems, that you, you talk about in your book where the U.S. government is is aware of this, uh, of these type of things, but it's as long as we don't see it. And the, and the companies, too. I mean, there's this sort of notion of, like, let's just keep this at arm's length and uh, so that, you know, we need it to happen. We just don't need it to happen. We just need deniability. Oh, absolutely. Everybody knows what's going on. I mean, this stuff is... is is well known in small circles, certainly in government circles. And there was a U.S. businessman named Jim Giffen who uh, was a middleman between oil companies and the government of Kazakhstan. And he was uh, actually indicted and tried in the United States um, for allegedly funneling money to the president of Kazakhstan and the prime minister. This is, I think, about $80 million. And uh US oil companies got very who had, were paying him as a consultant got very very big concessions in Kazakhstan and Giffen to the best of my knowledge never really denied um sending the money um to the president of Kazakhstan but his defense it was sort of a great it was a gray male defense was you know I was doing this for the U.S. government. Everybody knew what I was doing. The CIA knew. The State Department knew. And everybody was happy because I was working to get American oil companies huge concessions, you know, very valuable concessions in Kazakhstan. Um, and in the end, the judge basically tossed the case, dragged on for many, many, many years. And the judge said, uh, you know, you're an American hero. You, uh, you know, your government's been persecuting you. But all along, the government knew what you were doing and, and, and didn't complain about it. Um, it just turned blind eye because it was convenient, uh, because we wanted those concessions for American companies, not the competing firms. And I, it's hard to argue with that. I mean, if you look at Giffen's context with the U.S. government, um, you know, this, his relationship with the president was not a secret. That he was working for U.S. oil companies was not a secret. I mean... Yeah, the president of Kazakhstan would come to Washington and Giffen would uh, show him around and, you know, bring him to meet government officials and host parties for him. So, you know, I think fundamentally uh, he was telling the truth about his working with the explicit consent and approval of the U.S. government. Um, So that's definitely, you know, you just for the most part, I think the, the attitude is as long as we don't know what's you know, we, we may suspect what's going on. We may basically know. But as long as, you know, nobody really brings it to our attention, who cares? I mean, it's just, you know, it's business. That's the way it works. How, how does a guy like that, like Giffen or that Halliburton official you talked about, how, how do they end up um, being prosecuted for this in, in that context? I mean, what what is there just something that is just so flagrant? I mean, is there... Uh, are there are there rogue elements of the U.S. government that are saying we're going to actually uh, try and crack down on this? What what or or is it just like rival oil companies? Uh, you know, b- uh, mail an envelope full of evidence when they want to uh, when they want some type of advantage. Well, I wouldn't be that sinister or conspiratorial about it myself. Although I tend to be pretty <laughs> uh, cynical in general. I think um, uh, you, you know, when you we talk about the U.S. government, we're talking about millions and millions of people. We're not talking about, you know, ten people at the State Department and the CIA and the President and Secretary of State. You're talking about millions of people, and there are people in the Justice Department, for example, or the SEC, uh, uh, who every once in a while. Uh, you know, evidence may be presented to them. Uh, they may learn through a news report or or yet possibly, who knows, a, you know, a competing oil company or whatever. Something comes to their attention 
And they are, you know, their job is to to prosecute companies for for if they're operating corruptly overseas. And so they do it. And and I think th- there have definitely been times when you've had a conflict between arms of the government where, uh, and I expect this was true of the Giffen case that I was referring to, where you have maybe the CIA and parts of the State Department uh, that are saying, what, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this guy being prosecuted? You know, you know, this is just a big mess. It's, it, we, we don't need this sort of publicity. But there are career officials at some agencies who, who do, <laughs> who are doing their job. I mean, it, I don't think it's a question of, you know, the president snapping his fingers and making a decision and everybody um, marches to that tune. So you, you have competing interests. And uh, re- frequently, I think mostly, these cases just don't come to anyone's attention. These are deals that are cut in the dark. Nobody ever knows about them. So every once in a while, something comes out, as I said, either through journalism or, you know, a, the investigators in the government uh, digging up information. And, you know, you have individuals who want to move a case forward. So it happens from time to time. And sometimes I do think the government tries to squelch those investigations that, you know, other parts of the government that don't like it. But, um, you know, the government, as I said, it's, it's, it's millions of people. So we can't just refer to it as this, uh, you know, this monolith. I want to I want to talk about a couple of the characters uh, in in the book because um, it's it just sort of gives people I think a a sense of 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 who these people are obviously but talk a little bit about what Tony Blair has been up to um, the, the, I. I I I can believe how much guy this guy's making on on just giving talks. I'm definitely motivated yeah, I, now I, to get into the. I uh, did a chapter on. He's he's not really a middleman, but um, I you know I wrote about. Is he uh, like a fixer or what or what what I mean in that world? Uh, I mean uh, where you talk about the sort of the the. You've got the the the, the traders and the fixers and sort of I guess the. Uber fixers? Is he like an Uber fixer or something? Well, I put, him in a different, I put him in a different category, really. I mean, he's he's operating at a somewhat different level, and he does uh, mostly different things. I mean, he does broker deals, I think. There's no question about that. Um, but, he, you know, he's not... his his business, he's, he's got a, uh, you know, a consulting firm and he's hired to do all sorts of things. I mean, um, it's, it's not as narrow as just oil either. Um, so I just looked at, um, I, I think I, the chapter about him was a chapter about flax and promoters of the industry. And so Blair is available, uh, to do, you know, he, he profits from this in a few ways. I mean, one is, you know, he was very, when he was prime minister, he became very close to the president of Kazakhstan. Um, he developed relationships around the world in a lot of uh, energy-rich states. And, you know, he afterwards, for reasons that are mysterious, he got paid huge sums of money as a consultant by some of these these governments. I mean, the government of Kazakhstan, I can't even remember how many millions of dollars it paid him. Uh, the government of Kuwait paid him. I mean, I again, I, I don't, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I don't even have the book in front of me. Uh, but I, you know, tens of millions of dollars to write some report on its, you know, a review of its economy that, according to members of the opposition in Kuwait, I remember people said that uh, the report was just filled with, you know, obvious information and, you know, nobody could understand why he was, uh, he was, uh, um, you know, paid that sum of money. But I think just in a lot of cases... To be have, fair, though, um, wasn't didn't he do it in freehand and it was all calligraphy? <laughs> yeah, nobody really... Maybe that's what it was. Um, but so there, you know, in, it, there's that angle where he, you know, developed relationships as prime minister and, you know, some of the people he was friendly with were in, were in a position to hire him after he went into the private sector. And then secondly, he's, you know, he's made this huge sums of money, uh, uh, giving speeches around the world. Um, and I believe his minimum rate, uh, that I came across at one point was, um, 
I think a hundred thousand um, dollars. It may have even been more than that. Yeah, really, he made twenty what, million dollars um, per year. Right, between consulting and, and these these talks. I mean, sometimes he's just making, you know, he's getting paid three hundred thousand dollars to give a, a talk that's less than an hour. But I, you know, I discussed a couple of talks he gave uh, in my book where he he uh, was paid a lot of money to give speeches in Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, and um, just embarrassing. I mean, in Azerbaijan, which, you know, this is another, it's like Equatorial Guinea, one of those really, really rotten regimes. You've got a president um, whose family has gotten enormously wealthy, um, the very repressive government. There was a WikiLeaks cable where the, uh, I, I can't remember, was it the ambassador in Azerbaijan or, or another official in the embassy? But they described the ruling family of Azerbaijan. They compared them to the Corleone family of the godfather. Um, and, you know, Blair went over there and there was a businessman very close to the regime who was opening a gigantic methanol plant. And Blair went over there and made a pile of money to give a, a short speech in which he lauded the president of Azerbaijan and the, uh, you know, he talked about how wonderful methanol is, as if he actually knew anything about it. It's just, you know, if you offer enough money, he's willing, apparently, to say anything. And so, wait, so, what, I mean, what is the impact of Blair doing that? I mean, you know, so he's, like, clearly providing an imprimatur that that does what? I mean, it... Are you there? Yeah, you. I mean, you, you kind yeah, of, I mean, I guess I'm. I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind. You know, like I'm, I, you know, because we, you know, we hear these stories in 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 the main. You know, that uh, I don't know, Larry Summers or Timothy Geithner is getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, they, they give this imprimatur. What, but, but, what, what does it, what does it do that they get this imprimatur? Like, hey, you know, if Tony Blair is friends with the the, you know, Azerbaijan, he can't be that bad of a guy. Right. Well. I think that in part it's just uh, often payback for, you know, friendship and past favors. Um, and so it's an easy way for uh, governments to reward Blair for his favorable stance when he was in power. Same thing happened with the Bush family where, you know, uh, after the uh, uh, first Bush administration ended, you had a number of senior officials uh, and relatives going over to Kuwait, you know, because the Kuwaitis, of course, were eternally grateful to the Bush family uh, and, and and George Bush Sr. for invading, uh, you know, driving Iraq out of out of Kuwait. And so, I think partly it's just, you know, gee, you were really nice to us when you were Prime Minister, Mr. Blair, and now we can uh, return the favor. And partly I think it just looks good. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't think the local populations in these places where Blair speaks is super impressed with it, but it's a good photo op and a good news hit. You know, Tony Blair goes over to Azerbaijan and lends legitimacy to this rotten regime. So, you know, it's a cheap way. It doesn't, I mean, the owner of this methanol plant who paid him, I think, 100,000 pounds or something like that. It's not really very expensive. He's going to make a whole lot of money on the methanol plant. And, um, you know, it looks nice to have Tony Blair come over. It was actually, I think, he brought him over to inaugurate, you know, the, the inauguration of the plant or the, or the construction of the plant. So, you know, it's just it's, it's cheap PR, looks good. Blair gets a lot of money. Everybody's happy. So, I mean, just to sort of, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to bring this home, when we look at these people who are the sort of the intermediaries, and they're obviously crucial to um, the the functioning, I guess, of this. I don't know this uh, this industry. I mean, what uh, at the end of the day? I mean, how much are they? Uh, are, are, in the event that we do, because a lot of people are talking now about uh, the sort of the 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 broader implications of of trying to wean us off of oil or move into a new era. I think, you know, Chris Hayes wrote a piece uh, recently uh, calling, you know, what needs to be done in terms of dealing with climate change relative to uh, carbon companies is something, you know, akin to abolition. I mean, to what extent are, are, it's just that, are, are is this part of the apparatus sort of uh, holding it up or is it, is it, is this something that's just going to be a casualty in the event that we do get to that place where where we somehow 
wean ourselves off the idea of, of really cheap oil? Well, it's hard to answer that question because in my view, it's going to be a long, long time before we wean ourselves off of cheap oil. I mean, you know, our uh, oil, relatively speaking, I guess is more expensive than it was in the 1970s, certainly, but it's still pretty cheap, especially when you compare what we pay with what most people around the world pay for it. You know, it's it's a very cheap commodity. Everybody uh, expects oil to be relatively cheap or gas to be relatively cheap. So I I think it's going to be you know, a long, long time. I mean, that you just the the companies are just making too much money off of it. That's why you continue to see the climate deniers and um, this just refusal to confront the issue head on. Um, you know, Americans prefer cheap oil. Um, I think a lot of people don't think about the implications of it. And every, you know, the companies are making a lot of money, and the companies have an extraordinary extraordinary amount of influence with the government. So, you know, I not optimistic that this situation is going to change anytime soon. So it seems premature to talk about the post, uh, post carbon era. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, well, I mean, I guess it's just sort of, there's just so much money sloshing around that the, the, those fixers and the PR people, um, uh, they're just a, uh, they're a small segment uh, of the enormous wealth that is, is going around, whether it's, um, uh, the, the the dictators who are receiving that money, or the uh, uh, the corporations in this country, but um, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm always looking to see if there's a weak underbelly somewhere, and it it doesn't look like there is. Well, I mean, it's 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 unfortunately, I'd I'd love to give you a different answer, but you know, if I'm going to be honest, it's 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 hard for me to see a quick transition. Um. You know, and I, I frankly don't think that, um, you know, you, you look at people talk about, you know, the world running out of oil, but then shale fracking uh, comes along. Right. And alternative, uh, you know, alternative means of obtaining energy. So um, it may not be good for us, but as long as the companies can do it and make money and the government is, is facilitating all that, um it's hard to see a, a rapid transition. I don't think we're running out of fossil fuels. Um, so you, you know, as long as you have that situation, it just, yeah, it doesn't look good in terms of a swift transition. Ken Silverstein, a senior investigative reporter with First Look Media, the author of The Secret World of Oil. It will be on uh, majority.fm, a link, obviously, uh, to that book. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. 